just marginal independences, which is uh, not present in here. For example, here, we should remember by heart that uh, you know, this uh, V structure is going to induce uh, a marginal independences between the two variables, which is not encoded here. Therefore, you cannot use uh, any Bayesian network uh, to form a IMAP of uh, a distribution defined by this graph. Okay? That means there are nine equivalents between uh, these two configurations. And the same is true for the reverse direction. Right? So here I have a uh, direct graph model. And uh, this one defines, again, a distribution P okay, due to the, the factorization law that we learned about on Bayesian network. Right? And uh, for that, we also have uh, conditional independences. In particular, what is unique here is this uh, marginal independences or non-existence of a conditional independences. And you will find that uh, no matter how you connect these uh, three nodes using a undirected graph model, uh, they're not going to capture this. Right? And they actually uh, will produce some additional independences that is not here. So this basically gives you, you know, a uh, kind of a, a basic uh, foundation on why we need both Bayesian network and the Markov random fields, and because they each cover a subset of uh, useful conditional independences that we often encounter in real life. And uh, I remember at some point someone asked, is there a way to go in the middle where uh, some type of independences is uh, uh, that that is present in either MRM and MRF or or uh, BM uh, can be both captured? Well, in some way, yes. For example, what I haven't really discussed at length, and which is not a very popularly used model, is called uh, the so-called chain graph model, in which you have these so-called partially directed acyclic graphs. Okay, you know this is a graph an example of such a graph in which you see both directed edges and the undirected ones. And for those undirected ones, you can imagine you know, the kind of uh, uh, Markov random field-ish conditional independences being honored. And for those uh, uh, directed ones, you have the other set. Okay. So this graphic model is uh, somewhat flexible. Sometimes it may be convenient to you know, reduce them into a direct graph model by, for example, creating, you know, this as a super node. And then, you know, you basically will have a direct graph model where you have these two nodes and they point into this uh, super node and then so on. But uh, that kind of a simple treatment sometimes is not favored because what if there are many, many states, you know, in this uh, super node? Because uh, this is, uh, this uh, particular subset can be very big. Then you need to maintain a big table, which is not economical. But making this explicit representation, you know, using a undirected structure, can sometimes save prompturization cost. You can basically prompturize this uh, three node with uh, some uh, subclick potentials and stuff like that, right? Uh, but on the other hand, this is again not filling the space left by. MRF and the BN, because uh, the undirected edges and the direct edges are happening on non-overlapping set of nodes. It cannot happen at the same time on the same set of nodes, right? So uh, there are still some independences not captured. Therefore, graphical models is capturing really a subfamily of uh, all possible uh, probabilistic distributions over the random variables, and uh, this defines the domain of our interest. And uh, you may ask, uh, what happened to the other ones? Well, at this point, we say we don't care, or we don't uh, tend to work on that, because uh, those belong to the ones which is uh, not uh, easily uh, you know, manageable by a graphical model uh, in, uh, semantics. OK, so with that, I'm going to conclude our lectures on the representation. And the take home message is that you, know, you need to know these are two type of major graphical models. and uh, you also need to know some additional kind of classes which exist. And uh, when needed, you should be able to dig out the literature and read them. And uh, so why we care about this? OK, that's actually the you know, starting point of the whole rest of the class. 
So we use graphic model mainly uh, as uh, a language to uh, capture, you know, very, uh, you know, rich dependencies and independencies between random variables, which uh, is, uh, you know, useful in simplifying the cost of representation. And what's more important actually is uh, not only uh, just cost of representation, but uh, the cost of computing. We're going to use the graphic model on the road as a vehicle to uh, design very efficient algorithms for inference and learning. Sometimes the graphic model structure can be also a vehicle to construct proofs and analysis of uh, behaviors of probability distribution, but this is not a, a major uh, direction uh, at this point because they are very difficult and only in rare cases uh, such uh, insight can be useful. And we're going to hopefully discuss that a little bit. But the main actually uh, benefit of graph model is about representation computing. And uh, in fact, uh, there are you know, uh, uh, some actually uh, uh, cases in which you know, there are equivalences between the Bayesian network and the Markman field. So basically, there are a subset of graphic models which encode the same set of conditional independences. And uh, that's something we're going to study later more and more because uh, they are the preferred vehicle for carrying uh, universal and generic inference algorithms without uh, uh, making a, a graph dependent or topology dependent uh, computational procedure. Okay, so with that, we're going to now open this uh, new lecture of probabilistic inference. So uh, let me uh, first uh, uh, pave the, the roadmap and uh, then uh, zoom into some specific questions. So what are the main computation happens on a large multivariate distribution? And here I summarize in the following way. So given a graphic model, uh, the typical tasks that we care about uh, fall into these two categories. First is called uh, uh, answering probability queries of this form. Okay. Basically, you want to ask the conditional probability distribution of uh, a subset of random variables given the other set. And we use the word inference as a name for the process of doing this computing. Okay. And the other class of problem okay, is about uh, estimating what we know as the plausible models underlying a data set. Okay. The model actually can include both uh, the graph itself and the value of the parameterization. And uh, we're going to study both issues later on uh, pretty carefully. And uh, so this is known as learning. In statistics, sometimes the word learning is not often used. They also can be called inference, but in this case, it is inference about the parameters. And uh, there are different paradigms for carrying out learning and inferences, such as Bayesian and frequentist. We may be actually address a little bit on that as well when we run into the problem. So. Uh, Today, we're going to focus on the task of inference. So what are the main inference problems that we may run into? So here are the kind of interesting queries that we have to uh, know how to deal with. The, the first query, the most uh, maybe uh, uh, you know, uh, simple, but uh, in fact uh, still already quite challenging query is called uh, likelihood computation. It means that you know, I have a domain of uh, random variables up to one to n random variables. And uh, I've observed a subset of random variables in terms of uh, their exact value in the data. OK, I call them evidence. Now I ask how likely the observation is true underlying certain model. So this is the computation. You need to compute the likelihood of the data, of the evidence. And uh, you know, from the very definition, such a calculation involves a step known as marginalization. You need to sum over all the configuration of those random variables that you haven't observed. Right? And uh, up to now, I hope everybody should uh, understand that this is uh, a uh, pretty expensive step because uh, in the discrete case, this means enumerating all the configurations of random variable 1 to k which amounts to 2 to the power of k possible configurations. If it is a continuous uh, number, then you replace in the summation with integration. You have a, you know, a nested kind of a sequence of integrations, which can be also very complicated. Right? So this is an expensive step. The second query 
is known as uh, conditional uh, probability computation. Okay, and uh, in particular, we want to compute the conditional probability in presence of uh, evidence. We're conditioning on evidence. Okay, some variable being observed, and this is also known as a posterior belief of those unknown random variables. And uh, this one is. Uh, equally complex, if not more complex than likelihood computation, because a likelihood becomes the denominator of a uh, big table, uh, a big joint probability. And therefore, you need to do, do both this uh, marginalization and also you know, a, a division, okay, which can be non-trivial. And then there is uh, a special case of uh, the posterior belief, in which we are going to build the belief on not those uh, entire subset of uh, random variables we haven't seen. Okay. For example, suppose we have a model. Let's see, uh, you know, let's see we have a tree graphical model. And we only observe the bottom layer, say the current species. And we want to ask the probability of the, the most common ancestor given the current species. Okay. And the x uh, 1, 2, and 3. And uh, then what happened to the, 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 the layers in the middle? They are not observed, but we don't care. Therefore, uh, in this particular posterior belief calculation, we need to do marginalization over this uh, particular result further okay, to remove additional random variables. And that add on some more cost. So in a naive way, of course, this just involves uh, you know, summation after summation after summation. And uh, the challenge we are going to uh, try to uh, deal with is to uh, figure out how to uh, do this uh, particular step much more efficient than just do a uh, trivial summation over all configurations. And uh, here are some examples of applications of posterior uh, uh, belief query. And you can see that the posterior, the, the, the query nodes can be at the end of the generative processes, right? So uh, you can basically, uh, you know, uh, probably uh, use uh, uh, a simple procedure. For example, using the, the fact that uh, the graphical model has this property of deseparation. Therefore, your conditional probability of P C given everything else should be equal to P of C given B only. Right? That actually already makes implicit use of the graph structure. But if you don't see the graph, it will take you a while to figure out this particular simplification step. And uh, if the evidence is at the tail of a sequence of uh, events, and your query is at the head, same thing. You know, even though you have a lot of evidence to contingent on, you can actually simplify that by, you know, resorting to only the direct evidence. Right. So these are just a simple step of uh, graphical utility, but uh, you can actually imagine a lot more down the road if when I give you more examples. So that's one utility of doing posterior belief. Another important utility you are going to run into down the road very often is that, in fact, when you do the other problem called learning, this computation can be also useful. Even though learning is about uh, you know, estimating the model or the value of the parameters in the model, sometimes they also need to do the inference. Because what if the model, such as the one I drew earlier, had uh, intrinsic latent variables. Okay? In those cases, you cannot just uh, learn the model uh, trivially based on uh, a likelihood of maximization. Because uh, algorithmically, you will, you know, as we will visit the problem later on, they were involved in a quite complicated computation. So there was this uh, one simple procedure you probably heard about called EM algorithm. You know, once uh, they were in operation, they can somehow turn the problem into a simpler form where your learning just happen as if every random variables are observed. So why that's the case? Because uh, they give you a way of imputing the latent variables that you don't observe in an iterative fashion. And that imputation step actually is done through this uh, posterior belief inference. Okay? So that's why you know, inference can be made as a subroutine for learning. That's another utility that we want to uh, visit and make heavy use of later. So here is another example. You know, for example, this uh, very famous you know, vehicle nowadays used for many applications uh, called uh, Deep Belief Network. You know, this is, again, you know, you know, 
a inference problem. In fact, you can treat you know a you know deep belief network as a graphic model. And last time I actually explained that uh, you know one form of DBM can be you know uh, can be formed by stacking on top of each other a number of uh, uh, restricted bosom machine, right? Which are you know two layer you know, uh, latent space models. If you stack them on top of each other, you make a deep network. And the other way is to just uh, view the whole thing as a generative model where the direction is, uh, you know, one way. Say you have the so-called hierarchical Bayesian model, and uh, here is the, the latent cause, and uh, generating another layer of consequences, another layer of consequences, all the way down to what you observed. Then your inference is really about uh, putting the observation here, and then, you know, going upward and uh, calculating the posterior distribution of uh, every latent, uh, you know, latent layer given the evidence, right? So that's another posterior belief query that uh, can be made very useful. And uh, so, how to do this efficiently is the question we're going to address today. A third query that I want to uh, remind you is uh, they they don't look quite different from the second query, but they are a little bit different. It's called uh, the, the most probable assignment, which is uh, uh, what, what is known as uh, also the, the, the map inference problem, the maximum probable assignment problem. So here, you are going to do one more step over this uh, uh, posterior probability of, uh, query, of the query nodes given evidence, and uh, single out or, you know, or extract out only one assignment or one configuration, which is the uh, most probable. Okay. This is uh, not quite as, it, it's not quite different from computing this. Um, people may ask, well, this is probably just the same as the second query because I can just do this in my second query and then apply this one more step. Okay, that's true. Uh, but uh, if you do that, uh, you know, you don't actually uh, uh, sometimes benefit uh, some of the additional trick you can play, you know, uh, uh, for simplifying the computation. Because uh, if you knew that uh, you are going to only extract one configuration, you may not need the full posterior probability distribution in the first place. Okay? And if you realize that, sometimes your computation can be further simplified. And also another uh, uh, subtlety in posterior, uh, the, the, the map inference is uh, the following. Sometimes conditioning on uh, what you are, are querying about you may get uh, a very uh, different uh, answers. Okay. For example, here uh, uh, I have uh, uh, this uh, you know, joint probability distribution. And uh, I want to ask uh, these uh, two queries. For example, I want to ask uh, what is the you know, P of uh, X, uh, Y1, and Y2, and uh, max over y1. If you, you know, see this table, what is the most probable assignment of y1 in this uh, joint distribution? Any, uh, why it is zero? Mm-hmm. Okay, because uh, you just uh, count every column, and uh, you know uh, the 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 overall probability of uh, you know y being one is uh, these uh, two rows basically, right? Therefore, what you get? So y one star equals to what? Mm -hmm. So, given a posterior, pro uh, given a joint probability of two random variables, I'm asking the single most probable assignment of one state. One. It is one, right? And the reason is clear because uh, we are talking really about the marginal probability of a py, and uh, we'll maximize that. And uh, you should basically count uh, all the configurations in which y1 equals to something, right? 
y1 has the best probability. And uh, that's basically when they are equal to 1. But now if I actually ask the following. What is the joint configuration of y1 and 2? Most probable joint configuration. That is 0, right? The, the most probable joint configuration of this pair is going to be 0, 0, because they have a probability of uh, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 5. And then in this case, y1 star equals to 0. Right? So basically, uh, what I'm saying to say is that uh, the most probable assignment of uh, any random variable depending on its context. Okay, And that's basically a very important thing that can be made very explicit in a graphic model structure. Question there? Yeah. Here? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I've been unclear a little bit. Uh, I, I shouldn't have written that. Uh, yeah, so it's, uh, it should be actually y1, p of y1. Ah. OK. And uh, so there is a step that you need to get y1 from here. OK. Yeah, maybe I should say that more explicitly. But anyway, you know what I mean. So uh, I'm trying to. Yeah, I apologize for the unclarity. Maybe I should, because uh, I want to hide that direct notion. If I put y1 here, everybody should get the result, right? So uh, sorry for that. Anyway, uh, so uh, the main message uh, what I want to send is that you know, the from the the examples I gave above, you can probably realize that uh, inference is actually a pretty uh, you know challenging uh, computation task, right? They really require you to you know enumerate all possible configurations of uh, the, uh, the random variables, which results in a, you know, a MP hard complexity. And uh, therefore, sounds like uh, a bad news. You know, it is an MP hard problem. We shouldn't really attempt to uh, you know, hope for a, a good solution, a universal solution. But the point is that it does not mean we cannot do anything for inference. With the graphical structure and uh, with uh, some particular uh, uh, kind of uh, analysis of uh, the resultant distribution. For certain cases, there exist exact polynomial algorithms for certain graph model inference problems. And our goal is to actually, you know, make explicit uh, what kind of uh, families can be addressed in a polynomial way and uh, how to address that. Okay. So today I'm going to actually give you a high-level picture about uh, uh, how to actually, for example, uh, uh, discover those class of problems which uh, can be solved in a polynomial fashion and uh, what, are a ba what is the basic algorithm that you can make use of. And uh, so here is the overall landscape of uh, current state of the art in uh, inference. And uh, usually there exist two class of inference algorithms. Exact inference algorithm gets you the exact solution. They give you, you know, you know, a perfect, you know, right solution to the inference answer. And, uh, you know, by definition, almost, the exact inference algorithm only work for a subset of graphic models where you don't run into the NP harness because otherwise you're going to be famous, right? Uh, then for those really hard problem. You know, there are other techniques known as uh, approximate inference techniques. And uh, there are a few algorithms that are going to uh, discover. Okay, so these basically form almost the bulk part of uh, a good chunk of our uh, early half of the semester. You know, in, in, in. All right, so uh, let me begin by uh, a very simple algorithm. Hopefully, I don't bore you too much which is called elimination, that form the fun, forms the foundation of all exact inference algorithm. And the, the insight came from this uh, very simple example. So we have this uh, very simple graphic model, okay, a chain of uh, random variables, and uh, one node is observed at the, at the end. And imagine a real life scenario like this is a cascade of uh, you know, molecules uh, in some biological system, and we want to see the evidence, the likelihood of uh, uh, you know, a downstream event happening, for example, right? So that's the query. Computing the probability of uh, the last node in this chain. And here is uh, what you are supposed to do, right? We have uh, a joint distribution, and we're going to compute this whole thing, and we're going to sum over 
variable A, B, C, D, which are not observed. And, uh, and uh, we all know it is going to be expensive. But uh, now let's see. If we know this uh, joint distribution okay, is uh, factored over the chain due to our definition of the graphic model, this one breaks down into a product of these two terms, uh, these uh, few terms. Okay, so now I ask, does it change the way we compute? Do we still actually do this uh, enumeration over the four nodes on this uh, product of factors, or we can be a little more clever, in the sense that we can save computing? Okay, so remember our beginning place is this complexity. It is uh, you know a quadratic, it's a polynomial, uh, it's an exponential complexity defined by the number of. Uh, uh, parameters, uh, uh, variables, and uh, we're going to reduce from here. So here is what I propose. We're going to find a way to rearrange things a little bit for you know, a, a very uh, straightforward reason. Say here I have uh, you know, uh, four random variables. Okay? I'm going to do a uh, systematic enumeration. Okay? I'm going to, for example, enumerate in a way that I keep uh, C B, C, D constant and change A from uh, 0 to 1, for example. Okay, that's uh, a rational way. Keep for all of them for them being 1 or something. And then this particular enumeration is not going to touch all the terms in this uh, big product. Right? In fact, it will only touch the terms which contain the argument. So we're going to now move this part which does not contain the term outside of the summation. So we create this one. OK, after do that, then keep this thing constant. And uh, doing this only will result in you know, a, maybe an uh, a intermediate term, which we call phi, okay, which is a function of what random variable? B only, right? Because uh, all the configurations of A has been taken care of by this summation. Therefore, we have only B left. OK, so we now add B back to this list. And uh, we have suddenly one, two, three, four, four terms. OK, and uh, the fifth other terms that contains A is gone. Therefore, random variable A is longer in our scope. OK, and uh, so what is this B? Well, B is just, you can imagine, some kind of a representation of a function of B which uh, can be represented by a table, for example, depending on the, the configuration of a B. B can be a 0 and a 1. You just put a number there in the, in the table, which is no different from writing A or this. These are also just tables. This is just a new table. Right? But uh, the outcome is that now we have uh, you know, one fewer term in this product. And that game, actually, if you just uh, you know, you know, inspect this uh, exact way it, how it looks, this uh, phi b actually equals to the probability of b, exactly. Okay? So we're going to bring it back. And now we're going to now keep c and b const d constant and uh, enumerate b only. Okay? And uh, then all we need to do is to inspect this list and find all those terms which contain b. Okay? We're going to keep them inside and uh, move the rest outside. And uh, that basically uh, leads us to you know, another computation happening only to these two terms. Okay, and we're going to produce yet another new term called the phi of C, because B is not eliminated. And uh, that one happened to be equal to P of C. And we put it back there after we finish computation. Okay? And once we do that, we eliminate the B as well. Okay. So we just run this process on and on, and at the end of the day, we're going to eliminate every random variable, and then at the end of the day, we're going to reach to a term which actually corresponds to B of E. So it's pretty straightforward. It sounds like I did nothing, right? But uh, now if you go back and inspect the number of uh, steps that I take to arrive at this uh, final solution, you actually will see it is very different from the original naive exponential cost I have to pay okay, over the brute force summarization. In particular, the step I did is that each time I'm going to eliminate one random variable, therefore I eliminate four times. 
okay? And uh, in every elimination step, the core computation is actually this one. You know, I have a product of some terms, I have a sum over some terms, and you can actually do some work by yourself to compute how much is that cost in that every one step. And I suggest it is actually this cost, okay? It is actually corresponding to a product of uh, the number of configurations of uh, one random variable times the number of configuration of the other random variable. Because every time I'm only eliminating two terms, okay? Therefore, I only need to take care of uh, the joint configuration of these uh, two variables, okay? So it is a local cost of, uh, say, k squared. K being the number of states of every, every random variable. And I do it n times, n being the number of random variables to be eliminated. Therefore, my total cost is uh, n to the k square. Okay. And now you compare to my original uh, cost, you know, that will be, you know, if I do uh, the naive exponential uh, summation, I'm going to have uh, n to the power of k number of uh, summation steps. Okay. So this is a very subtle analysis that is not very obvious. And uh, but as a result, now I do systematic elimination, I managed to reduce the exponential cost to a quadratic cost. Okay, so that's the fundamental idea behind a elimination. And uh, we're going to now uh, study this uh, uh, case more carefully to see how, how generic it is. Get the idea? So the key idea is that I'm going to now systematically perform my summation such that no global enumeration is needed. I'm going to do local computation at a much lower cost and do the local computation n times, n being the number of variables. Okay. All right, so remember this and uh, let's maybe uh, visit another example to see how this idea can carry further to more complex scenario. So everybody still remember this? This is a, a hidden Markov model and uh, so, uh, you know, we know the base network definition, therefore the joint probability of, uh, you know, all the random variables here can be now multi expressed by this uh, very long product of terms, okay? The term includes the, the initial probability, the transition probability between two states, and the emission probability of uh, the observation given the hidden states. Now, I ask you a pretty challenging task, okay? So I'm going to ask you computing the conditional probability of, uh, say, any one of these random variable, conditioning on the entire sequence of observations. Okay, this is a very famous inference problem that people ask on and on in HMM. For example, what is the probability of uh, you, uh, the dealer choose a, a loaded die at step three, given that I see the entire sequence? Pretty non-trivial, right? And uh, obviously, you know, you need to do this computation where, you know, somehow this one corresponds to the marginal probability or the joint probability of this and that, right? And then you need to basically sum over all the other y's that you don't care, which actually is expressed in here. You need to sum y1 up to yi minus 1, and then i plus 1 up to yt. That's the entire collection of y's that you have to uh, eliminate, okay? And uh, then you copy down this, you know, into a, in this form. That's basically where you are at right now, okay? So I ask you, how can you, you know, this is a pretty non-trivial, you know, summation. You know, the, the sequence, the t, can be hundreds of steps long, and uh, therefore you really cannot do it uh, in, a, in, a, in a nice way. But uh, now, given the ideas I just showed you before, do you now have a better idea? In fact, I believe now you are probably very close to inventing a very famous algorithm in HMM known as the, the forward-backward algorithm just in minutes. Because uh, if you just copy the idea of elimination, you are pretty much there. Okay, maybe let me uh, do the experiment for you. So how about uh, we do the following? We're going to now systemize my summation so that uh, I put uh, y2, y3, you know, all the way to uh, yt here, okay? 
and uh, I'm going to basically, uh, you know, put a lot of stuff here, and I'm going to bring my y1 here, okay, and uh, I'm going to, you know, leave here only those terms that contains the argument of y1. So what are those terms? P of y1, and what else? Any more? That's all we have, right? Okay, so how about uh, I just, uh, you know, wrap this up? And uh, regardless of what they are, they're going to give me some kind of uh, a term, which I call M, which is a function of what? Y2. They can only be a function of Y2 because Y1 has been taken care of, right? Oh, x1, yeah. Uh, how about uh, we, uh, okay, let me put x1 here, fine. But uh, x1 is a constant. You don't actually treat them as an argument anymore. They are just the evidence, right? So, uh, uh, yeah, I can put, actually, let me uh, eliminate, you know, just for the sake of uh, cleanness, uh, I prefer not to write uh, a y, a x1, but uh, just bear in your mind that it is there. How about that? Okay, and in fact, we can write further. What is the exact meaning of M2, or MY2, if you remember? So this times that gives you the joint, uh, gives you what? Uh, the joint of uh, Y1, Y2, and the X1, right? And if you sum, you are going to get a P of uh, X1 and Y2. In fact, that's what you get, okay? Anyway, we're going to now do one more. I'm going to do y3, y4, everything up to yt, and I put all the terms, so on and so forth here. And then in here, I'm going to sum over y2. Okay, so what are the terms containing y2 in this whole uh, collection? Just to clean up the whole space a little bit. Do we have, uh, you know, we certainly have this uh, M message Y2, right? And uh, we also have uh, P of uh, X2 given Y2, right? We also have uh, P of uh, Y3 given Y2, right? How about uh, we do that here, and we create a new message called an M of Y3, because it can only be a function of M3, a Y3, right? And then you can, maybe I should ask one of you guys to do it right now, what does uh, M Y3 correspond to in terms of a probabilistic definition? Mm -hmm. So uh, I haven't done the computation, but I guess it must be X1, x2 and y3. It must be that. Okay? Okay, so now you can see the idea, right? So I'm going to just do this systematically, and each time I'm going to do one of this summation and create uh, one of this message, this term. What is the cost of that? That's something you want to ask yourself. Okay, so here's analysis. First of all, in this step, we're going to eliminate this and generate a M2. And uh, then we eliminate this and generate M3. That's basically the production step. And uh, the cost can be measured in different way. But roughly, it is about uh, taking care of each time a pair of latent states, right? And do some summation. So what is the cost of uh, a pair of uh, hidden states? Suppose that every hidden state has k, k values. So isn't that uh, k square, 
right? So roughly, you are going to pay about k square to get you this particular thing, right? And you're going to do it t times, because uh, you're going to each time get rid of one such random variable. So roughly, you are going to get uh, a cost of this to finish this uh, whole sequence of computing, OK? And I bet you later you will find that uh, this algorithm is exactly the same to the very famous forward algorithm, OK? You are going to generate this message called forward message and using this uh, very local computation. And the forward algorithm is nothing but uh, an elimination algorithm on the HMM using this particular ordering from the head to the tail, OK? All right. Uh, maybe if you are not enough, I, I can have one more example, which is called backward. And uh, you can imagine here, you know, I'm not going to uh, do the detail for the interest time, but you can try. It's really about, uh, you know, getting everything one, you know, you know maybe uh, uh, y uh, t minus 1, and then you have all the terms in here. But uh, you are going to do yt and p of uh, yt, uh, yt minus 1, and p of uh, xt and uh, yt, and so on. OK, we are going to basically now take care of the last kind of uh, variable first and uh, do an elimination. We are going to get rid of that. And that leads us to another kind of intermediate term, which now is a function of what? It can be only a function of yt minus 1, right? In fact, if you compute that, you will realize that uh, this one actually corresponds to you know, uh, you know, something like a p of uh, uh, you know, xt given you know, uh, yt minus 1, something like that. Okay? And again, that's actually a very generic nature. At the end of the day, you will find that you are going to repetitively generate this type of message, which always equal to a probability of this one, okay? which is uh, the probability, the conditional probability of uh, a later chunk of the sequence given conditioning on a predecessor state. And that's also known as the backward message. This corresponds to the backward inference algorithm in HMM. So, in about three minutes, you already derived by yourself the forward-backward algorithm in HMM, which is supposed to be one of the most celebrated algorithms you know, in, in all, all machine learning, right? So it's very simple, elimination, OK? And I can go on and on with a lot of things. For example, now I turn this whole thing into an undirected graph model. What you originally had are uh, now switched from uh, a, a local conditional table to potentials. But likewise, you can still do the kind of uh, systematic summation and uh, eliminate each of the random variable out by directly sum over the potential functions instead of the local conditional probabilities. Okay? In here, your local message phi will be not a problem, and maybe let's call it m, will not be a probabilistic one, but uh, a pre probabilistic one as a function of some potentials. And I can even go further by this. Uh, CRF algorithm, which is also very known, a very well known, very famous algorithm. And the inference algorithm in CRF is also actually an elimination algorithm. You know, once you put all these uh, potential functions, the, the exponential potential, potential functions into the original form, you have actually still product of potentials. And you can apply the same idea as I told you. Okay. So, so much for the examples. Now you should uh, get some high level summarization of uh, what we have done so far. Okay. So what we have done so far is uh, a very, very interesting way of uh, dealing with uh, this animal. Okay. This animal had this uh, very unique uh, form such that it is first a product of uh, phi. Phi could be potential, could be local conditional, could be intermediate terms produced from the previous summations, anything. and. Uh, they basically belong to some collection of such, kind of some such, we, we generically call them potentials. And then you are going to, and also they are certainly a uh, random variable of some underlying arguments, which being unknown random variables. And then you are going to take a outer summation, okay, z, to get rid of, you know, that particular variable that you want to eliminate, right? 
Okay, so that's basically you know a step which we called the sum product operation. Okay, in a sense, elimination is about you know making use of this uh, sum product operation repetitively over a certain ordering of random variables, so that every node being touched in this way can be eliminated. Okay, so that's the first key concept. This particular step is uh, useful in many ways. First of all, it gets us a algorithm, okay, which uh, uh, turns, you know, the uh, the originally exponentially complex algorithm, you know, into a uh, you know almost polynomial algorithm, you know, on certain graphical models, which has a nice structure. And secondly, it helps us to identify what kind of structure can benefit from this kind of uh, reduction in computational cost. And we're going to actually expose that uh, uh, inside very soon. OK, so here is the general idea. OK, we're going to now uh, you know, you know, deal with this uh, very generic but complex uh, marginalization step by uh, you know, iteratively moving all the irrelevant terms out of the inner sum, perform a innermost sum, get the new term, and insert the term back to the product and do it recursively. At the end of the day, we're going to get uh, something which is uh, closer to our query. For example, in here, it is going to be a term that includes our query and uh, a evidence. Then it is naturally corresponding to the pre-normalized kind of uh, answer of our query. And we're going to normalize it and get our query. Okay, so that's really a, you know, a high-level summary. And uh, let's see, out of uh, outcome of elimination, well, the outcome of, out of elimination is uh, uh, these uh, factors which uh, get uh, the variable that you are not interested in eliminated. So here, before I summarize the entire form of the algorithm that you can go and code up, I want to in, uh, mention one subtlety here, which is uh, 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 the trick of dealing with evidence. So in a graphic model, you have uh, all sorts of random variables. Some are observed, some are unobserved. So a rational treatment, of course, is to sum over all the unobserved random variable and uh, leave uh, the ones being observed intact, right? And that's, that's if you are a human being, you know, this is the rational thing to do. For machine, this is a little bit uh, ugly because uh, that basically implies a, uh, a non-uniform treatment of all random variables. If we just uh, upload a graphic model without knowing which one is uh, uh, observed and uh, which one is not, then down the road, depending on the dynamic kind of incoming messages of uh, something being observed, something being not, I'm going to elicit heterogeneous treatment of every random variable, which is, you know, algorithmically a little bit uh, uh, messier. Right? So, um, some people prefer a clean formulation to treat every random variable homogeneously. Say, we're going to do what I did just now, like the sum product operation on all random variables. How about that? Regardless of your query, then what should we do? So this is uh, a suggestion. We're going to now produce something called, introduce something called evidence potential, in which, you know, suppose I have uh, some random variables, maybe uh, E, you know, that has been observed, you know, by, uh, you know, the lowercase e. And then we're going to introduce this uh, delta potential, meaning that uh, if uh, the random variable itself, the symbolic random variable, equals to the actual observed value, then they, this potential equals to one. Otherwise, they equal to zero. Therefore, to harvest this evidence, you need to still do a summation over all the configurations of e, okay, so that you can get the evidence out. The good thing about that is now, once you, you know, create such an evidence potential for all the evidences and then multiply them with the original potential in the graphic model, you suddenly have uh, a uh, starting point which allows you to run some product algorithm in a homogeneous fashion. You don't have to treat anything differentially, you know, whether it is being observed or not. Okay, so that's just a, a, you know, a stylish, you know, a, you know, a, a, a particular algorithmic style that uh, the early founders of uh, graphic model uh, literature uh, find to be interesting. So we're going to uh, inherit that kind of uh, wisdom. 
Now let's talk about uh, this uh, overall algorithm called uh, elimination. Okay. So it starts by, you know, say suppose I have a black box algorithm. I need to take input, and uh, here are the only input in a very clean generic sense. You need to have the graph. You need to have the collection of evidences. You need to have the set of uh, random variables to be eliminated. In fact, we also need an order for them to be eliminated. That's something which can generate a huge differences down the road, as we'll see, okay, in terms of the efficient computing. And uh, then we're going to have uh, the query random variables. So now we're going to initialize the graphical model. Okay. We are going to uh, have another routine called the evidence. And we have another routine called uh, some product elimination and normalization. And that actually concludes the computation of uh, some product. And let's see uh, what each corresponds to. So initialization is very easy. Okay. We are going to make use of uh, this uh, ordering. Essentially, it is about creating a stack. Okay. And uh, call it F, for example. You are going to load the stack with uh, all the potentials, phi 1, phi 2, and so on and so forth. Okay. And uh, the ordering is dependent, is actually uh, given you know, as an input as well. And uh, then we're going to also load the evidence. Okay, grow the step further by putting the evidence potential there. Okay. So here is the key step. We're going to uh, perform the so-called the sum product variable elimination, and that's basically happening in the first way, uh, in the following way. You know, you are beginning with a stack of potentials. Okay and uh, a list of variables to be eliminated and their order. And uh, so then for every you know, variables in this uh, list with that order, we're going to input to a subroutine called the elimination, the stack itself, and the variable to be eliminated. And as a consequence, generate a new stack. So here is the old stack. This is the new stack. OK. And uh, then we are going to also uh, produce uh, uh, at the end of the day, you know, uh, yeah, I think uh, this is the iteration. And once you are done, you are going to have a stack which only contain the potentials that is of your final interest. And you multiply them together and get your query out. And here you need to have a normalization step to get them uh, uh, normalized. So up to here, I haven't really talked about an interesting story, right? That the key step is really here, how this particular thing is happening. And here, I have a uh, you know, pretty explicit uh, uh, description of that particular algorithm, which again uh, is uh, crucially depending on the definition of that uh, potential stack. So as an input, I got this in. OK, I got this uh, stack. Suppose that uh, I have a lot of uh, factors, so on, OK. And uh, I have uh, one random variable to be eliminated, which is uh, the z, OK. So I need to first have a thing, which I call the scope of z. What is scope of z? That basically means all the terms in this stack, which uh, has uh, z as one of its argument, OK. And uh, I use that to define a set subset of the stack, which is called F prime. Okay. And uh, the remaining is, of course, the complement of that is F double prime. Okay. So I'm going to basically do something with uh, stuff in the F prime in the following way. So for all the factors in the F prime, I'm going to make a big product. This is the product step of the sum product operation. Okay. And uh, then I'm going to generate uh, this uh, giant product of potentials of uh, factors. And then in this uh, factor, uh, product factors, I'm going to now do a summation over the z so that the z can be eliminated. Okay? And obviously, they're going to generate a new factor, tau. Okay? And uh, so that basically means this one is getting you a tau. And I'm going to put tau back to the F, to F double prime, okay, to create a new stack. 
Okay, where here I have every double prime and I have a tau in here. Okay, then I come back. So this is just uh, a algorithmic uh, realization of what I said to be the sum product idea. You each time identify the variable to be eliminated and their potentials, and uh, you know, do a sum product step uh, on the product of factors, and then create a new factor, put them back to the stack, and then reoperate on that new stack for the next variable to be eliminated. Clear about that? All right. So <clears throat> if you are clear about that, let's uh, take some time to work on a uh, potentially more challenging problem. So here I have a uh, slightly less trivial graphic model. Here is a graphic model, okay? You can imagine a story behind that graphic model. And at the end of the day, I want to answer this query. I want to answer P of uh, A given H, for example, okay? Meaning that uh, everything other than A has to be eliminated. So how should we do that? So how about now we do it together, like to revisit that algorithm and the mechanically and see how actually that helps us to solve the whole problem in a more efficient way. Okay. So we begin by you know, you know, identifying the graphic model and uh, all, the, you know, all the factors used to define this graphic model. So this is my initial list of uh, factors. That's basically my F, right? And I have uh, a, a, a elimination ordering. I just want to follow a so-called natural ordering, okay? I don't, don't ask me how I, why I call it natural. I just happen to know this order to be good, for example. Okay, so this is a ordering. I'm going to start from H up to B, which looks like reasonable from bottom to up, okay? And uh, okay, so what's the first step? If I now have everything, I have, I think in fact, I have, yeah, I have the F, I have the order. What's the first thing we should do? Anybody uh, want to suggest? I mean, this is nothing mathematical or complicated. This is a pure computer science style, right? We, we are operating a algorithm right now. Remember, the first step is to uh, take care of the evidence. We need to enlarge the stack by putting the evidence potentials, right? I hope I have it here. Uh, yeah, so it is in here. So we're going to do the conditioning step. Okay, put the evidence potential here. And uh, then eliminate that uh, evidence variable. Okay, that basically is the first summation, okay, over H. So operationally what's happening, we're going to basically visit this uh, whole stack and uh, take out the terms which contain the variable H that I'm to eliminate, right, and then eliminate it. So that's basically what this step is happening, is doing, right? So I create an intermediate term, this one. Okay, now, now what? Now I should uh, get rid of these two things and uh, put it back to the stack, right? So hopefully that's what I did, yes. So I get rid of that, I put this back, and uh, now I'm going to touch my second, I'm going to eliminate my second random variable. Okay, the second variable need to find its scope, right? The scope of this one, well it's trivial, it's like only this one term. But again, just for you know, for a uh, formality reason, we're going to do it nonetheless. So uh, this is uh, a, uh, a sum product step, which is kind of trivial. I produce a factor of one, nothing. But still, we managed to get rid of this, right? And, uh, and then what? Uh, we need to put the one back, okay? So that's basically moving the list from here to here now, right? Okay, now things become more interesting. My next one will be F, okay? And the list the list of uh, factors I copied from the previous page. And uh, these are the factors containing F, right? And uh, so I'm going to copy this down. Okay, here's a product of factors containing F, eliminating F, and they produce an intermediate term which happened to be 
uh, a, a term with uh, A and E be its argument. Okay, so here it's worth well pointing out that uh, the way I name this intermediate term is kind of tricky, right? I use a uh, sub-index to indicate the variable I just eliminated. And I use, uh, I put the actual argument inside the bracket to indicate that this term is a function of these uh, two uh, variables, okay? So after this, what I should do? Okay, I should now bring down this list to here, right? Eliminate uh, these two and uh, put this back. So up to here, you probably can see mechanically what I do, right? I pretty much uh, repeat uh, the sum product operation, you know, keep uh, taking a Q, finding the factor, eliminating the factor of interest, generating a new factor, and reinstall a new Q that is hopefully shorter, and eventually that Q will diminish and uh, give me back the answer, right? Okay, so I'm not going to repeat that. You can just uh, visit all the steps, and uh, at the end of the day, I'm able to get to the list to be containing factors that only matters to my final query, okay? All right, so this is, uh, again, variable elimination in action, and uh, you should uh, now take home about this uh, uh, particular algorithm. And also, you need to take home about this message. Why we do that, okay? So what, I, what you just see, actually, again and again in a number of examples, is uh, clearly exposing you these uh, two steps, okay, which actually helps you to generically analyze the cost of the sum product algorithm. First is that uh, you need to actually, uh, uh, you know, produce this uh, product, okay, of uh, all the factors. Uh, encoded, included in the scope of uh, the variable to be eliminated. And then you are going to do a, a summation over that right variable to be eliminated over this uh, multiplication of uh, factors, or product of factors. How many actually multiplication it takes to finish this step? Okay, so it is this much, okay? Basically, you know, for every, you know, here I, I put uh, Y to be, uh, YC to be, you know, the component of a C, uh, 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 the, the component in the graphic model that the variables are, are defined on. Why? Because uh, remember our definition of graphic model, the, the, click poten the potential functions are defined on clicks in the graph. Therefore, here I put more explicitly Y correspond to every clicks in the graph, right? So every click had their possible configurations, and here I use a val of uh, YC to indicate the number of configurations of that click, and I have uh, I such clicks, okay? And then, of course, that corresponds to every value of the X, right? And I need to do it K times, okay? So that's the amount of uh, multiplication you have to do. And likewise, you can also deduce uh, the number of uh, additions that you have to do to complete this step. But uh, at the end of the day, I hope you realize that uh, both of these steps will incur a cost that is uh, only polynomial to the number of states in every random variable rather than exponential. In fact, they are exponential only in this part. Okay. Okay. Basically, it is exponential to the size of the click that you used to define the intermediate term. But uh, outside of a click, they start to multiply and become multiplicative, okay? All right, so uh, that's basically the benefit of doing a sum product algorithm. You are going to now reduce a globally exponential algorithm to a locally exponential algorithm, but a globally polynomial algorithm, okay? Where the polynomial is dependent on the number of clicks you use to define the model and the complexity is dependent only on the local clicks that you produced. Okay, any questions at this point? If not, let me move on to give you a little bit more insight uh, where such analysis can be made even easier. So if you remember what I did earlier, whenever I performed one of these uh, eliminations, 
actually had uh, another little graph coming here, actually documenting what is happening, right? For example, in here, I'm going to uh, eliminate uh, E, for example. Then after it is eliminated, I get this one, which is uh, quite of interesting, right? E is removed, and then here C and D and the A are parents of the E. After the common child is uh, eliminated, I actually get the parents all interconnected. That kind of operation is actually documented graphically, and here I repeat. Okay, every time I'm going to remove one graph and add some edge to tie together the neighborhood of uh, the nodes being eliminated. And uh, this is actually uh, the sequence of uh, intermediate graphs I produced. And now if I go back and uh, capture you know, the components being eliminated plus you know, the edge I added to denote the consequence of such elimination, I actually have the following thing. You know, there is a sequence of uh, subgraphs which correspond to you know, every step of my elimination, which include the variable being eliminated and also the rest of the variables that are coupled with the variables being eliminated and also the edges resultant from their elimination. So if you ask what this correspond to, what does all these uh, little subgraphs correspond to? Can you guess that? Yeah, that, that clicks. They, uh, why, why we care about these clicks? And do, do they actually correspond to any of the, the algebraic entities we created in our elimination step? Let me play that again. So we eliminate this. And uh, when we eliminate H, we actually said we generate this function, right? And uh, when we eliminate G, we said we generate this function. And again, when we eliminate uh, F, we kind of generated uh, this function. And you can see that each of the subgraphs resultant from a elimination, graph elimination, correspond to the intermediate terms I produced from the algebraic elimination. Okay, so there is this uh, very interesting correspondence between algebraic elimination and the graph elimination. Okay, graph elimination being a simple step of removing a node and tie together their neighbors. Okay, so just to make explicit, each of these steps here correspond to one of the, you know, intermediate subgraphs that I produced during my graph elimination, and that's actually a key insight. Why? Because now you can establish a equivalence. explicitly what could be the possible eliminations that uh, uh, intermediate products you generate in your elimination step. Okay. So why this is interesting? Anybody have an uh, insight on why it's interesting? Yeah, so there is this interesting notion about the elimination order people probably didn't uh, pay attention to at the beginning. In fact, the way I actually uh, eliminate the graph uh, is heavily dependent on uh, the order. If I, de if I eliminate, for example, a particular node and, uh, in a different order, I may produce a different set of such things. For example, uh, if I still have the graph back, for example, in here, what if I eliminate uh, this guy first? Okay. I will get uh, a particular entity where these uh, five nodes are interconnected as a five uh, node clique. And uh, now we know that it must correspond to a intermediate uh, uh, message that I produced in algebraic elimination. So now without doing that, I already know it's going to happen. Then I will tell myself I'm not going to do that because that particular term is pretty expensive to store. It is a five dimensional table rather than what I see here. At most, it is a four-dimensional table in my now better elimination orders. Right? So uh, that's one insight. And the other insight is, of course, uh, what is known as the so-called message passing thing. You can also see the order of the elimination creates uh, a simulation where every kind of intermediate term 
can be viewed as a message generated from the click being eliminated and sent into the next click to be eliminated. Okay. So uh, that's another insight we're going to make use of later. So now let's discuss this uh, 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 size of the click a little bit more uh, uh, carefully. Actually, the size of the click that uh, we just saw before is uh, a crucial uh, element defining the complexity of the algorithm because that's the bottleneck of computing. If you keep generating M, okay, the storage cost is uh, really proportional to the computation cost because uh, you need to basically put a value for every joint configuration of uh, this message. Therefore, you want it to be small, as small as possible, right? So now you can imagine the biggest intermediate message that you're going to produce in this uh, sum product algorithm is going to be the definition of the complexity of your algorithm. Okay, so that's why it is uh, called the tree width of uh, uh, the the click potential uh, the, the elimination algorithms. I'm going to be more specific about why it is called a tree, but it is a width of a certain data structure. And uh, if the click is small, you are going to get a less expensive algorithm. Okay, I'm running out of time, but uh, let me finish by drawing an example here so that you can hopefully, uh, you know, uh, Rick's, you know, hopefully inspire yourself more about uh, the importance of this uh, uh, click size and also order of the elimination. Say we have a star algorithm, a star model. Okay. And uh, what are the possible ways of eliminating nodes here? One way is to eliminate from the side, right? I'm going to cut this one, cut this one. And according to my graph elimination procedure, I cut and tie together their joint parents, all their, par all, all their neighbors. I basically need to do nothing because uh, every, every node had only one neighbor. Right? But uh, if I eliminate from the heart, then I'm going to suddenly create a gigantic intermediate term which uh, needs to store the configuration of all the variables in my domain, which is not good. So that always suggests you a better and a worse ordering and which matters. I can also have a tree here. Anybody can figure what might be a good elimination? From the leaf, it's called a peeling algorithm. It's a very interesting algorithm, almost as interesting as the four backward in HMM, invented by geneticists. Indeed, the best idea is to go this way. So now you can see again, graphic model is really interesting, right? Seeing the graph, you know, directly inspire you to seek a simple solution, even though, you know, this problem is NP hard if you get the wrong order. But uh, you still can get a good order, you know, if uh, you have the right uh, intuition about uh, the structure. Okay, so that's the benefit of uh, graphic model, and we're going to discuss more uh, uh, the, the, a few, maybe five ribbon lectures uh, slices next lecture. Okay, see you on Wednesday. Yeah. To make sure that everyone uh, is on the mailing list. Oh, okay. Uh, one more announcement. Uh, the TA reminded me that. Uh, Maybe uh, not everyone you know, in the class is now registered to the mailing list. So if you do not receive regular announcements from the TAs,